Okay, I think uh, we're ready to get started. I want to uh, introduce myself. I'm Ellen Fantini. I'm the managing editor of the European Conservative. Uh, and I'd like to welcome our live audience and uh, the people who will be watching this uh, on video. Uh, today's event is part of our continuing series uh, investigating some of the EU's legislative priorities. So our first event uh, was the overview of these topics with a panel discussion with policy experts on three of these legislative priorities. Security migration policies, the digital transition, and the so-called Green Deal. So following up on that exciting discussion, today's event will uh, focus exclusively on this Green Deal. Of course, the term encompasses a great deal. It covers everything from energy policy to agriculture to uh, industry. Uh, so today, we're going to look at how hyper-regulation by bureaucrats uh, hurts ordinary people or affects ordinary people. We will unpack some of the motivations behind the mo this legislation as well as the science. Do they want us to freeze all winter? Do they want to destroy farmers' livelihoods? Do they want us to just eat bugs? Should people be able to hunt on the land they live on? So our distinguished panelists are um, Rob Rose, a senior politi uh, politician of the J Dutch JA21 party. He's been a member of the European Parliament since July 2019 and is currently the vice chair of the European Conservatives and Reformist Group. Uh, Mr. Rose is also a successful businessman, has founded and managed a number of companies in the Netherlands. So. Uh, Mr. Rose will be speaking about legislation he's most concerned about, including some of the recent agricultural reforms, their impact on farmers, and he'll also talk about the language that is used, uh, perhaps to um, force people to be on the side of such legislation, um, feel-good language, perhaps. Um, then we have uh, Samuel Furfari, uh, here. He's a, a recognized authority on energy policy based here in Brussels. Uh, he spent his entire professional career as a European civil servant at the European Commission's DG Energy for 36 years. He's a professor of geopolitics of energy at various universities. He taught energy politics and geopolitics at uh, the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, from 2003 to 2021, and since 2019, he's been the president of the European Society of Engineers and Industrialists. So Dr. Fufari will talk about the energy side of uh, this uh, Green Deal, in particular about the effects of energy disarmament, heating taxation, and he as well will talk about some of the, the science behind what we're being told are the goals of um, some of this legislation. And then we have, to, um, just to my left, Sebastian Morello. Sebastian is a lecturer, public speaker, and writer. He's published books on philosophy, religion, politics, history, and education. His most recent book is The Conservative Case for Religion by Establishment. Um, uh, Conservative. Uh, conservatism and grace. Yeah. Conservatism and grace. Um, published by uh, Routledge. And he lives in Bedfordshire, England, with his wife and children. He's a senior editor and editorial board member of the European Conservative. So the structure of this uh, discussion will be that each of the panelists will have a few minutes to uh, talk broadly about um, these topics uh, within their specialties. And then I'll pose some questions uh, for the panel, perhaps interrelated, perhaps uh, separate issues. And then uh, we hope at the end of this, there'll be a chance for some questions from the audience. And um, we'll give the microphone to the audience member so their uh, questions are recorded and then we can uh, have some answers. So um, I'd like to start with Rob Rose. 
Well, good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Rob Rose. I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, actually, I consider myself not as a real politician. I consider myself as a uh, representative of the people, and I think that's uh, a big difference. I went into politics because I was worried about a lot of things going on in my country, the Netherlands, 2016. Um, that's what I, when I started to think about, uh, we have to change a lot of things. I had an engineering company in energy. I had also a telecom company. And um, what I saw that was that um, we, were, we were busy with an energy transition that was not serving the people. I thought this is not possible what we uh, want to do. And of course, I'm in favor of uh, phasing out fossil fuels um but more in the perspective of uh environment air pollution etc and uh but th the the whole thing about climate that was obsessive now uh, i'm coming to the green deal um when i entered the parliament the green deal was uh, implemented i was not very in favor of that because it has such an impact of the way we live and um, for me, that's, uh, that, that's incredible because it's not something that people have asked for. We live in a democracy. And it's, a democracy means that um, it, the, the, the power to the people and, and we as representatives of the people should listen to the people. But it's so strange that we have a green deal where also a climate law is a part of the green deal uh, the the farm to fork strategy etc but th th those are all subjects that no one has asked for it has never been in 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 the netherlands for uh, at least uh, in a in a political program and still we are in this so what kind of democracy do we live in and maybe that's a, a good question uh, for uh, for someone who studied philosophy, but I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm looking for practical solutions. That's that's uh, what what you do as an entrepreneur for for problems. Um, the Green Deal. Um, we want to phase out fossil fuels, and we do that with renewables. That means wind turbines, solar panels, and also biomass. Nuclear is excluded. I'm very against that. We need nuclear. If you want to phase out fossil fuels, you need nuclear because you need, you need a steady base load in your network. It also has a lot of advantages. And um, the, this, this uh, renewables, let's uh, start with, uh, with the wind turbines. Um, the, the, the energy density is so low and also from solar panels. I have them, eh? I'm not against solar panels. I have them on my roof for 10 years. But to, to make solar farms and to use um, fruitful land to produce energy, for me, that's, that's incredible. It's, it's destroying nature. And we as conservatives, we try to preserve what we have. And nature is a very important part of that. But the Greens, they use this narrative. They sell their Marxist, Marxism agenda um but but uh, it's it's the watermelon that, that it's red in, in inside but they have a uh, they made a beautiful package of it and so you it, it looks very good from the outside but i think we as conservatives are more concerned about nature because climate policy is contraproductive for the environment we need so much raw materials um, and we create so much waste and we produce so, uh, yeah, because of the low energy density, the, the, the energy production is very low. We need a huge amount of land space. We need a huge amount of everything. And that's, for me, that's, that's not um, in, in favor of, of saving nature. Um, biomass is a scam at itself because it sounds so good, bio, that, that sounds good. But we are burning complete forest to, to, to save the planet. We talk about 
um, we talk about um, biodiversity. And that's the, Mr. Timmermans, he's coming also from the Netherlands. He is always talking about biodiversity. This is destroying biodiversity. Also, uh, these wind turbines at sea, 450 gigawatts, that is what the European Commission wants to install at sea. And what is that doing with, with the life at sea? The fish and, and, and also the birds, etc. It will be a permanent um, construction plant. So it's it's very hypocrite, but I think it's on purpose because if you want to control the people, you have to control CO2 because everything we do in life leads to CO2 emissions. So if you want to control the people, and, and th then the, the easier thing to do is, is control CO2. Why is Germany closing its nuclear power plant, B Belgium also? Um, th this is the, the real solution and also the research in, in the next generation, the fourth generation nuclear power plants, um, that, that's really a very good solution. Eh? The molten salt reactors and the, there are even uh, molten lead reactors. This is real innovation. Then we are independent um, because we want to be independent of Russia, um, the Russian gas, but we, we created our problems ourselves because we uh, decreased our energy production, reliable energy production too fast. And then um, we, we were dependent on, on Russian gas, but that's not the blame of Putin, that's the blame of this strategy that they took. So if we want to have real innovation, if we want to real, be real independent, let's go um, for the research to the, to the next generation nuclear power plants, and, and that is the molten salt reactors, etc. cetera. That, that's real innovation. So, but you see that also, uh, in, and that's also part of the Green Deal, the, the, the farm to fork strategy. Um, they use CO2 to control people. Now they start uh, with the environment, and that's the nitrogen problem. In the Netherlands, we have a huge nitrogen problem, uh, but it's only a problem on paper. It's not real. I think the nature in the Netherlands is, is doing very well. The last four decades, we made such progress. When I was young, uh, there was no, uh, we had uh, just two, two kind of birds in, in, in our garden and some ducks in the, in, in the water. But now I see all kinds of uh, birds. Th that's what I see with my own eyes. And the farmers in the Netherlands, they, um, uh, they reduced the nitrogen production with uh, almost 70% since the 90s. So they did a, a tremendous job. And now with this nitrogen, we they look only at the farmers. While we have also uh, we have a lot of immigration. There are a lot of people coming to our country, so that produce. We need to build houses. They have more cars. We have more transport, and that's also a part of of uh, yeah, uh, let's say a, a kind of polluting and a nitrogen production. Um, so, if you want to solve that problem, you have to look at all the other things as well. The farmers are to blame. They want to get rid of the cattle for 50%. Um, and that's, that's huge because at, at the same time, we have the, the SDGs, eh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, promoted by the UN, also adopted by the European Union. And they say we want to get rid of the food shortages, zero, um, uh, zero hunger. But that's what we have achieved in the last decades. In the 80s, there were constantly food, food shortages in, 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 in Africa. So if you want to, uh, um, we had one of the greatest inventions of, of times and that is the fertilizers. And that's how we created uh, enough food production for 8 billion people. And now they want to cut that and to get rid of our farmers. So for me, it's, it's not logic. Um, I don't think it's the real agenda. Um, and, and, and for me, it, uh, yeah, if, if I look at it, it has to do with earning money by uh, big corporates. Um, they, they invest in all kinds of uh, renewables in, 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 in land and also um, new kinds of food production. And you mentioned the bugs. Uh, I asked questions about that to the commission. I think this is, um, I don't want it. I, I'm not going to eat it. I think it's, it should be really um, 
very clear on every label in the supermarket that uh, food pr uh, has as uh, box ingredients in it. Because for religion, uh, people, uh, but maybe uh, people from uh, Muslim countries or Jewish people, they have their own restrictions, but also um, it, it's, it's admitted that it is not, um, probably not safe for people. They, you don't know what, uh, what the reactions of the body will be. So um, a lot of things that, um, that is what comes up in my mind first, and then I'd like to give the floor to, uh, to my colleagues. I've I've already uh, taken notes on on some of the points you raised because I think they're they're certainly um, will propel some interesting conversation within the within the panel uh, when you get to that. So uh, yes, we'll turn the floor to you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, that uh, I am a pro-European. Uh, I worked 36 years in the Commission because. Uh, uh, I am convinced that uh, we need Europe to unite us and to do uh, uh, the nice thing that we have done during 60 years. During 60 years, we have achieved fantastic result, And it's only the last, last 10 years that we are destroying all the success of the past. Second thing, it's important to remind that energy is life. Without energy, there is no life. When we take food, like here in the restaurant, it's because our body needs energy. And without energy, we cannot li have a life in, in the world. It's impossible. And all our economy needs energy. And energy is the same notion in physics of work. Work is energy, energy is work. If you take one uh, worker working during one month, nearly 150 hours, the quantity of work that he is doing is the equivalent of 1.6 liter of gasoline, three euro. Somebody have to work one full month for three euro. So you understand that we are in a world where we will need to have more and more energy in the future. And because since, uh, well, since 1973, so since 50 years, we have not been able to replace fossil fuels and nuclear energy with renewable. Of course, renewable are growing in the world, but fossil fuels are growing more uh, the last 10 years, in non-OECD country, the share of wind and solar represent 20%, 20 percent, 20 percent of the increase of the demand of energy. That means that the increase is due for 80 percent by energy that in Brussels they do not want to hear about. So the problem is precisely that that the world is using more and more coal, oil, gas, hydro, nuclear, the energy of the past, which indeed are the energy of the future. The future will not be wind and solar. If we are in a fortress EU, if we close all the border, we can do what we want. But in an open world, this is just impossible. Wind and solar, after 50 years, of subsidies, of research, represent 3% of the primary energy, including in the world, not only in the EU. People knew that, you know, when uh, we, uh, after the Second World War, they realized that we will need much more energy to grow, and it's why they create the ECFC uh, treaty. And after the ECFC treaty, uh, the sixth foreign affairs minister met in uh, Messina, in, uh, in Sicily, and they say, what should we do now? We have created a common market for coal and, and steel, we should do something more. And they decide two things. First of all, to create a common agriculture policy. 
because people were struggling to have food. And it has been a tremendous success, thanks to the EU, thanks to the technology, thanks to the farmers, because I would like, I'm not, uh, it's not my field, but I would like to, to pay tribute to the farmers because they, have, they look for the innovation, they want to protect the nature, and they want to give food for us. So it's, a, it's time to recognize uh, the, the great work that the farmers uh, have done in, in Europe. The second thing they have decided, Messina, in '55, is to create a, a, a common policy for the nuclear energy. At that time, it was called atomic energy. They knew that we will need more energy. Energy is life, so we need energy. And we cannot avoid to have that with nuclear energy. And so today we have a treaty. We still have a treaty, Euratom Treaty, which is in force and normally the Commission should defend this treaty and not create difficulties. So I wonder how is it possible that the, the Commission is always trying to put aside a treaty which has been the base of the EU creation. In uh, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, there is another, uh, another article. Finally, there was an article in the Lisbon Treaty, Article 194. But I'm interested in the 94.2, which say clearly that member states are free to select their energy and to exploit their energy. It was a common sense. You cannot prohibit Poland to use coal, or you cannot prohibit nuclear uh, Germany to forbidden nuclear energy. But everybody should be free to do what they do want. With the climate change policy, or Green Deal, or Fit 55, you call it as you want, but it's always the same. Decarbonization of Fit 55 is all the same. They want to control member states. And this is a non-respect of the Lisbon Treaty. I'm very surprised that member states are not complaining about that. That's very true. So you see, they do not respect Euratom, and they do not respect the uh, Lisbon Treaty. It's a huge problem that needs to be solved. And uh, the third point of uh, 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 Article 194 is that if you want to deal with taxation in the field of energy, you need to have unanimity. That means that it's very difficult. It's why it has been introduced in the Lisbon Treaty. Very uh, difficult to reach unanimity when you are 27. Even if UK have left, it's remained a difficulty. Nearly impossible, of course. Well, they are bypassing that with the what they call ETS, or uh, the new system to tax carbon without using the word tax. And what have uh, been uh, what have occurred last week? just nearby here, I oh, know it was in Strasbourg, not here. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, it's a shame. 74% 74 74 of MEP voted for an increase of price of the eating system for people. You imagine in the middle of an energy crisis when everybody's crying about impossibility to pay the bill, they decide to introduce a carbon tax. They do not call it carbon tax, but it's a tax. Of course, they say, well, it will for 2027. Yes, but the decision is taken. And the hypocrisy is incredible. They had maybe 28 if the price of energy is too high. But the price of energy is too high. So I'm very shocked to see that what was the base of the Lisb of the of the Messina uh, idea is no reverse. What was the because I what was the idea in Messina? And you can read the resolution of Messina, and you will find this fantastic world. There will be no future for the community at that time. It was community and not union. There will be no future for the community without cheap and abundant energy. And today, there is no future for the EU 
without cheap and abundant energy. And there is no future for the world without cheap and abundant energy. And we have reversed with the Green Deal this vision of the father of the EU because they want scarce and expensive energy to save the planet. That's incredible. Incredible because we will pay more for eating our houses, even for uh, the kitchen, eh? because it is, uh, when you cook, you use energy. So it will be an increase also for that, for transport, for airplane. But in the meantime, China is building two nuclear power plants in one year, uh, sorry, 100, 100 nuclear power plant in one year, two per week. Incredible. And they have announced, Reuters have said that uh, two years ago, they have announced that they will speed the development of new coal mine. And we want to pay more for obliging people to save CO2? I, don't, I do not understand in which world they are. And I, I finish with what I said at the beginning. If they continue like that, people will be disgusted on the EU when we need the EU. Thank you. My, my notes are getting longer because there's so much to discuss. And I really would encourage the people who are here in this room to, uh, to make notes uh, for, for questions because the, the, there's a, a rich discussion to be had. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it to Sebastian Morello. Uh, for his thoughts. Well, um, I think my thoughts will probably be a little bit parochial uh, after uh, after that. Um, I'm not thinking at this uh, high and lofty level of, of policy so much as um, just somebody who grew up in the countryside uh, and, uh, and was formed by... Um, life in the countryside and uh and uh, as i was inducted into um the hunting community in england and started to understand what wildlife management uh, was all about and um it something that i have become particularly sensitive to i suppose is the the way in which the the term conservation has gone out of fashion that 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 we have moved towards a model of uh regreening or rewilding or uh, or environmentalism and you know as somebody whose background is in philosophy i'm i'm i suppose i'm sensitive to changes in language because changes in language generally uh, imply um, a, a shift in worldview uh, that, that's that's roundly held. But conservationism is quite naturally coupled with conservatism, with a with a uh, a desire to conserve the environment around you. The, it seems to me that that the language of conservationism has gone out of fashion because. Um, there is increasing appetite for a uh, a, a, a day a day one view of the age in which we live. Now, obviously, um, the the desire to begin our world from scratch has uh, been a, a curse on the European and the Anglo mind pretty much since the 18th century. And, um, and and was was a major um, a major part of the drafting of new constitutions and the age of revolution and you know 1789 and 1848 and it was all wrapped up with this new rationalism that had emerged. But the trouble is, um, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is is the big difference between having an essentially and I know this is a very unpopular way of speaking but having an essentially backward-looking worldview or a forward, future-looking worldview, the difference between these two is, in the former case, you actually are looking back to something that has existed, right? And so you actually do have a treasury from which you can learn. If you have a constant 
you, we must only look to the future, we must start from day one, you're actually marching into the dark all the time. And this is, this is the, the great concern. So um, in England, the history of conservationism has been quite interesting because it has been wrapped up with our particular hunting traditions. You know, the way that we used to manage our deer population, for example, in, in England in the, uh, in the 18th century, was that you would have um, beaters in the woods with flags, and they would drive the deer through the woods, and then all the farmers would stand on the edge of the woods with shotguns, and there would just be this great big bloodbath, right? And, and this was a total disaster for our deer population. So um, in the next century, we started to introduce the continental style of, of deer management, which was to be very, very careful about the deer you were stalking, whether you were stalking elderly or unhealthy or specifically for meat, and you would do it with a rifle, so you're only taking one at a time, and you would actually manage the population. We also um, had stag hounds, so we had stag hounds in Somerset and so on, um, and, and, uh, and, and in Dorset. The, these, uh, the, the thing about hounds is that they are uh, sort of a synthetic wolf pack. They will, they will do what wolves do. They will deliberately look for the ones that are weak or sick and therefore a, d a danger to their own species, and they'll go for those. Um, uh, hunting with hounds discriminate in a way that hunting with, with uh, uh, rifles or shotguns do not discriminate. Um, uh, and so through our tradition of hunting with hounds, uh, for example, hunting the fox population uh, was absolutely fantastic for our, um, our, our ground nesting bird population in England. The, the curlew um, species, the, the lapwings, have massively suffered since the, uh, the hunting ban. Um, unfortunately, people in the, in the early uh, 20th century uh, introduced the American mink in, into England um, people who wanted to make uh, fur coats, and they escaped, and they killed all the otters and the water voles and a lot of the, the waterfowl. Well, countryside people, seeing that the wildlife that they loved was rapidly di disappearing, were, were innovative and entrepreneurial. And so they said, well, what we'll do is when foxhounds can no longer hunt because they're too old and they're being retired, we'll turn them into mink hound packs and we'll go out and we'll deal with the mink population. They started to bring back all of our native species. All of these clever, innovative ways. If you, if you say, if you mention hunting to uh, somebody who has been brought up in an exclusively urban environment and isn't familiar with countryside ways, they have a Disneyland conception of animals, and they immediately say, well, it must be evil. It must be evil. But, uh, and, and people love to quote in England, uh, people love to say, oh, well, all the polls suggest that over 50% of the population want to keep uh, a ban on hunting. Yeah, but over 50% of the population live in the middle of the city and have never seen a wild animal in their life. So um, the, it, the, this, is, this is not the best way to decide how people who live in the countryside are going to manage the environment in which they actually live. I'll just make one final point, if I may, uh, a, a, um, uh, perhaps a slightly more philosophical uh, point. Um, another thing that really worries me about, about the retreat from the language of conservationism and the embracing of terms like rewilding, and, and maybe we can talk about rewilding because I, I happen to have opinions on that too. Um, but uh, the, the, one of the things that worries me is that it, it has been coupled with the notion of a climate emergency. And whether or not there's a climate emergency, um, if you accept the Vogelian and Schmittian uh, notions of how uh, late modern political regimes function, the, it has become a trope of new politics to declare states of emergency in order to enact power grabs. Um, we saw this in a very, very unconcealed way uh, during the pandemic. And to have a situation in which now the emergency isn't that you might get sick, the emergency is that the entire world is going to implode, right? That, that pretty much 
uh, takes all limits off the degree to which um, political institutions can carry out power grabs. They have the ultimate justification for carrying out the biggest power grabs. And, it, and, and that should worry us if we look at the way that late modern politics actually works uh, and, and how um, traditionally democratic institutions are becoming less democratic through the constant declaration of states of emergency. This should really uh, be a concern. That, that's a perfect way to, um, to close your opening remarks because um, there, there are two themes that I'd like to explore a little bit more um, with the entire panel because I think all of you uh, touched on them. And the first is linguistic. Um, and, and what I mean by that is uh, there are terms that have been used I, I, I think this idea of, um, as uh, Dr. Frufari said, it used to be that the goal was cheap and abundant energy, and now we're looking at uh, scare, scarce and expensive energy. Uh, that's certainly um, quite a pivot. But pulling out a few of the, the favored words or terms, I think about the words sustainability, uh, renewables, uh, even the word environment rather than nature, um, I, I think the, the, the language that we used to use about conservation and being a conservationist uh, really has switched to these sort of Marxist or neo-Marxist uh, terms um, relating to the green agenda. So I'd love um, for, for each of you to talk a little bit about these terms and, um, and what's behind them. Uh, each of you also spoke about this idea that there is, at its core, uh, a desire to control, whether it's to control the member states, whether it's to control individuals, because as you point out, uh, the moment you're talking about carbon, you're talking about human beings, right? This is a naturally occurring, this is not some synthetic chemical um, that a petroleum plant um, pumps out. I mean, we're human beings. Carbon is, uh, is part of our, of our uh, makeup. And then, and then uh, this idea of using emergency language, this crisis, the world is on fire, all of these things, and the idea that use of that language essentially is the ticket for control. So if you would just talk a little bit about some of these terms specifically, um, sustainability in particular, I think is a good one, and then what you think about uh, the use of control. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to speak about two, uh, two type of expression. First of one, the last you mentioned, uh, sustainability. First of all, we should not use this word because the Brundtland report in 78 uh, said we have to prepare a future which is sustainable development. Sustainable is the qualificative of a substantive. The idea was to grow. Sustainable development is growing. But progressively, the word development drop. And we, invent, we have accepted sustainability. But we reverse the concept. The concept wa was to have growth. And now they change again the concept. Because I don't know if you realize, but here in the ghetto, we, we start to use less and less sustainability. And we use more and more decarbonization. And for people, it's the same thing. And at the end, we pass from sustainable development to decarbonization, which indeed it's a uh, alias uh, stopping the growth. Huh? It's a degrowth. Decarbonization is degrowth. So we reverse completely the concept of the United Nations. The second one is on uh, sobriety. It's a new word. We need to be s sober. Well, sober is a new word to hide uh, 
degrowth with the small concept of energy saving or energy efficiency, because there is a lot of mixture between energy saving and energy efficiency. And you will see that in the document of the, com of the, of the council, they mix both concepts, energy efficiency and energy saving, which is not the same. You go out from the room, you switch off, this is energy saving. You change the lamp, this is energy efficiency. But they forget about that and they introduce sobriety that means that we need to save the planet and use less energy. But so this use of the word sobriety or being sober, um, what they really mean is austerity, but they don't want to use that exactly. word because uh, people know what that felt yeah. like in the very recent past. They want scarce energy and expensive. That right. means we need to have sobriety and austerity, uh, taking less shower. Uh, that's a, a vision. You know that in Germany, they are taking less and less shower. They even uh, uh, wash themselves without soap to save the planet, huh? so, and with cold water. But it's older than that. <laughs> the first time that I found the word appropriate for what we are saying about energy, not to spare energy, is in 1924 with President Calvin Coolidge in USA when he said we need to conservation we need conservation you see we come back to what you were saying at that time people were afraid that there will be no more oil so you see that when they talk about the end of oil it's 99 years story <laughs> and they say there will be you no know, oil so we need to conserve energy so we pass from conservation to austerity Yes, well, we see that also in the um, we see that also in the parliament. It's all about wording. Um, in every file, in every report, uh, or um, in everything we do, um, it's all about this also gender language. Um, the, the 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 difference between men and women. They wanted to disappear. Um, but also the using the words of uh, social, uh, they all, the, the, well, to be honest, the Greens uh, of the, the progressive have really a very, very good strategy and we should learn as conservatives from that because I, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the ECR and we have also our uh, think tank, which is uh, New Direction. And I said, one of the things that you should do is make a conservative um, uh, a book with, with all these good words for conservatives, a, something like that. But social, uh, so uh, they have also social entrepreneurship. It, it, it's not, and they want to change industry for sector. And so facing out all the things that that is needed to to make money because that's the, to being sober uh, earning less money uh, using less energy and but the people who are telling that they live a pretty rich life with good food lots of traveling safe houses sometimes houses with fences uh, but uh, the, the, they don't want to have uh, that for for normal people so it's also leading by example and that is um, even the um, the head of office of mr timmermans um, Diedering Sapson, said food and energy has always been too cheap so now they it, it's policy to make it more expensive the only way to to fight poverty is making more reliable and cheap energy. That's the only way to, to get Africa out of poverty, uh, all the all these countries. So we need not we don't we don't need less energy. We need more energy, and of course we have to save the planet. But um, yeah, well we talked about that. Uh, nuclear energy is a solution. You don't need uh, much land. Um, 
um, and, and you can produce as much as energy that you want. But scarcity, that is really the way to make money. If you create scarcity, then um, yeah, big corporates make make a lot of money. And in my in my view, what we see with all this, uh, the greens and and the, the progressives using all these new words, um, changing our society, and that starts at elementary schools, that's in universities, uh, they are changing the minds of our children. Our children, the most of the progressive don't have children, but but conservatives they they have. So they they really uh, using all this language and also in in school books etc. And um, but to be honest, we have let that happen. We were there and we thought it is not so bad as it is. But w coming back at the European Parliament, everything we do is is about wording and also um, gender, green, social etc. You cannot really have an open debate anymore because if you want to um, to 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 speak about problems, uh, for example, uh, the energy transition. I was very against the way we did our energy transition. Then you are a climate denier. If you we spoke about it, the the pandemic, uh, if you it's, it's, if you speak about the 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 things they implemented the the restrictions for uh, most most of them were restrictions and the obligations the mask etc um if you if you're against that then you were an anti-vax also using wording to to silence people and to cancel people what we need is an open debate in everything if we have um we don't have to disagree if we don't have to agree with each other it's, it's good to disagree but we should have an open debate but that's not possible anymore and it's also supported by social media it's supported by big tech the problem is is real huge and and the the, the question is how do we get this this open debate back because the, uh, sorry uh, to to interrupt, but I was just thinking, as you said, um, this this open debate is not possible, and I I isn't it true that that social media plays such an enormous role? Because if they are the arbiters of what's true and what's not true, what's fake news, um, and and they slam these warnings on on posts they disagree with, then then the culture of open debate is is silenced even there. Uh, so there's no place for it. No, but the the, the real problem is that it's, it, we have seen that with the Twitter files, it's supported by the governments. Even now in the Netherlands, yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday, there was a discussion to uh, cancel one of the um, um, public medias we, that we have uh, because they are also um, showing the other side of, of, of the debate. And, um, but but that's, that's really worrying me. Um, you, you cannot use the words anymore that you want to use and, and um, it's, it's a kind of inflation of our language. And um, it's, yeah, it's just not good. Well, uh, I think um, we have a very small amount of time to rescue the word nature. It's still an acceptable term. I don't think it will be for very long, by the way. And obviously, um, there are a lot of uh, young people in humanities uh, departments um, all across the West at the moment um, being uh, told that the very concept of nature is an invention of a of a patriarchal system that wants to impose uh, limits on you that you can escape through uh, technology. And so ne we will soon have a whole generation of people who, who for whom the word nature will have extremely negative connotations. Um, but but we're we're not quite there yet. And you know, um, people people still get a warm, fuzzy feeling when they see, you know, natural yogurt or, na you know, th th this word is still acceptable, but it won't be for long. I I'm being serious about this. I mean, it, it, you know, go, go on to Google and type in the words xenofeminism and you will learn exactly uh, what is popularly being said about the concept of nature 
um, as a as a as a main mainstream set of dogmas in um, elite universities in their humanities departments. So this word is is going to rapidly go out of fashion. I think people who see that kind of ideological trajectory is a problem, need to do everything they can to, um, to rescue the word while it's still up for debate. Um, the, the, uh, the push towards talking about the environment rather than nature is very serious because the term nature implies that whatever all that stuff is, is in some way contiguous with whatever we are, right? It, 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 the word nature doesn't really allow you to cut yourself off from the rest of the world. And so because you are implicated in the rest of the world and because you are contiguous with it, you have to constantly challenge yourself about the kind of relationship you have with nature. And it lends itself to an, a, a worldview of organicism, which is the, the bedrock of sanity. It's the bedrock of a sane worldview. Once you accept terms like the like environment you're immediately accepting that whatever all that stuff is that you're surrounded by is something fundamentally other it's so something fundamentally different to whatever you are that lends itself to the kind of urbanization and virtual world uh, that that we're rapidly moving towards which is going to give rise to a completely different kind of human being with a whole load of different kind of moral commitments so so just as a as a as a prudential practical point i think people who are who aren't insane yet need to really fight for this word while it's still up for debate question do you make a, a difference between environment and ecology because i have the impression that here in brussels we use less and less environment and more and more ecology which at the end is a kind of philosophy uh, environment is uh, existing but ecology is a thinking it's a religion in, in mm. the well um <coughs> if i if ecological concerns don't uh don't refer to us as well, then it's a problematic term. Uh, and um, and this, I, I think, you know, uh, in an essay by uh, Alistair McIntyre, he makes an interesting point that um, any city where you can stand in any of its main squares and not see um, the, uh, the countryside is already a problematic uh, urban environment. So, you know, I don't know what he has in mind, probably Florence or something. Um, uh, Florence is the one city where, where you can see the green hills wherever you are. Um, but uh, uh, but I, think, I think it's... Uh, it's it, look, the classical distinction that people used to make, the people in the Aristotelian tradition, was between nature and art. And art isn't something separate from nature. It's not a departure from nature. It's the human attempt to bring nature to its perfection. That's what people are doing when they are managing um, wildlife, when they're hunting. That's what people are doing when they're um, clipping back uh, the forest so that trees can grow bigger. All of that stuff, you know, if you'll allow a, a, a theological interjection, um, the first commandment that God gives is to tend to the garden, right? The, the, the job of, of human beings is to, in some way, see him uh, see themselves contiguous with the world and then bring it to a state of flourishing, um, not to cut ourselves off from it. So uh, if, if ecology uh, entails uh, the latter worldview, then we're dealing with ideology. And, and the, the job of sane people at the moment is to offer a pathway out of the arena of ideology altogether. I, I, I was thinking about um, the use of the word abundance and how abundance, uh, growth, uh, all of those things were signs of success. Um, the, the idea of the, the cornucopia filled overflowing with uh, the fruits of our labors. Uh, these are images that are, are not only out of fashion, I would say, but are in fact sort of disgusting or repugnant 
to um, to the people who um, who are are pushing this agenda, this idea of scarcity as a virtue, or um, or being deprived of something as somehow uh, virtuous rather than a sign of of, of decline. Um, but I I also I also wonder about this hypocrisy. You know, uh, you've several of you have used the word um, hypocrisy, and I think um, I think it, it's well illustrated not only in how uh, how people are living. Um, whether they're living well in um, in well-built houses in safe neighborhoods with plenty of food, but also um, the idea that uh, the the hypocrisy in the language when they talk about democracy, in fact. So so as as you pointed out, um, uh, Rob, uh, this idea that so many of these decisions and their decisions, not debates. Decisions are being taken uh, without checking with the people in contravention to many of the treaties that have been in place. And so uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, the use of, of uh, hypocritical language. So we're always talking every day, we're always hearing that democracy is dying, right? If you don't do this, that's the de end of, of democracy. But this... Um, this hypocrisy seems to be really undemocratic. Would you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, there are a lot of things that are really undemocratic. Um, for example, the, the European Union, how it's built itself. Um, if you see that uh, the initiative of new legislation is, is, uh, is is at the, the European Commission and those are all unelected people we cannot hold them accountable I try to do my best to control them that's that's my job to to, to ask them questions etc but I never get an answer if I get an answer for example um, and, and that's a real that's a real issue um, Two weeks ago, there was, no, three weeks ago, we had elections in the Netherlands and direct, directly after the elections, we, I have to go back, we had elections. We had the, our farmers citizen movement, they had a huge score and they, uh, they, they really, um, it was a landslide uh, winning for them from almost from nothing. It's, it was really very good. And I'm very happy with that if, because for me, it doesn't matter who is doing the job, but, but it, if they can change the system, that's, that's perfect for me. But um, they are against this nitrogen problem and to get rid of our farmers. So they really fought for the farmers. Direct after the election, there was a letter from um, uh, the commissioner, and I always forget his name because it's too difficult for me, but he was from uh, Sinkovicius, yes. Um, and he, he wrote, in 2030, the nitrogen reduction must be uh, at, at a level of 50%. So for me, it was a kind of interfering with our elections because it was really uh, contraproductive uh, well, for what the people have voted for it. That was a clear vote from the people. This is not what we want. We have to stop this. And this for us is an emergency signal. Direct this strange letter. So I want to have uh, a clarification about this. And I asked for, uh, to, to get this commissioner to the parliament and to explain this. It's not possible for me to, to get him there. So we, um, we had to vote on it. Um, we, we asked for an amendment, and, and um, but but it, it it it's just in our national parliament. If our minister is doing something strange, the parliament said you have to come and explain, and it's an obligation to come. So this is um, a first thing of democracy. How can I control it? Uh, how can I control a commission that is unelected, had huge much of power? Um, it's, it's not controllable. That's that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, and that's maybe uh, even worse, 
that um, now I'm, I'm uh, a negotiator on the SDGs, the Social Development Goals. That is something from the United Nations. Who has asked for this Sustainable Development Goals? No one. 17 goals. Sounds too good to be true, and I think they are too good to be true. If you look at it one by one, it's really, an, um, yeah, it's amazing. No one can be against zero hunger or against no, no poverty, that, that kind of expressions. But it's really, th this, these agendas are pushed by NGOs, and these NGOs are funded by philanthropists. And these philanthropists, have, uh, they have financial interest in pushing this agenda in a certain direction because there, there are their investments. If, if it's about energy production eh, because of renewables, in, it's about uh, food supply, etc., buying land, uh, it's uh, everything. So this is an agenda that is pushed. No one has asked for, and it's coming. And it it was not in any um, it was not in any uh, um, political program in my country, but I also think in the other member states. So this is how the decision making is is moving away from the citizens, and that's why democracy is yeah it's an erosion of our democracy. Um. I'm totally in agreement with what you say, sadly. Uh, but I would like to say another thing. The hypocrisy that we have with Africa. Nearly 50% of the people in Africa are not connected to the electricity grid. And the lucky that are connected to the electricity grid have electricity from time to time. Accordingly, the, the most important way <coughs> to produce electricity in Africa is with diesel generator that they have at home, because electricity is, is switching off continuously. And we are telling them, you should develop renewable energy. We have not been able to do more than 3%, and we tell them, we will give you money, if you develop renewable energy, of course, buying Siemens turbine, eh? yes. of course. But it's worse than that. Now we have uh, found a rabbit in the hat, hydrogen. If you want, I can sp speak during uh, half a day about hydrogen. <laughs> but what, why it's hypocrite? Because German know that is impossible to produce hydrogen in Germany with wind and solar. Well, they said that at the beginning, and now they realize that it's uh, really impossible. They want to go in Africa to produce hydrogen to drive car in Berlin with hydrogen, uh, hydrogen when there is no electricity in Africa. And the first country that they are eating is Namibia because there, it, there is a lot of sun in Namibia, and also, of, also because Namibia was a, co a German colony in the past. But Namibia do not produce electricity. Namibia do not produce electricity. They get the electricity from South Africa. And German want to go there to produce hydrogen with electricity to run the car in Germany. And the commission have approved that. In the strategy of July 2020, Commission have introduced a full paragraph on this question. I have to recognize that the uh, European Council, in its uh, uh, strategy on hydrogen of December 2020, didn't mention that. They realized that it was really too much. So, but anyway, the idea is still going on. And Belgium, for example, we are in Belgium, Belgium want to do that also. Germany want to do that in Morocco and in uh, in Namibia. That's sad, that really, to humiliate uh, African people. 
Well, I'll, I'll just say something, if I may, about um, perhaps in defense of uh, sobriety or um, frugalism. or it, it, does, it does seem to me that um, we can't keep farming as we are farming. That uh, this hyper-industrialized uh, way of farming. In, in the UK, we have done enormous damage to our topsoil. And actually, in the West, we are fast becoming the first people in history, perhaps, who are overfed and undernourished because of the amount of pesticides and herbicides that we're using. Uh, we're, we are uh, not allowing the soil to regenerate. We're just bringing in new topsoil every year from places like Ukraine and Moldova, which now we can't, and it's very expensive, so people are trying to think what to do. And of course, they're, they're actually by necessity going back to the old methods, which is, which is to have arable and herds and circulate them, so you allow the fields to get back their nutrition every three years after using them for, for, um, for, uh, for arable farming. And it seems to me, I mean, um, it, it is bizarre to me that we have completely lost a sense of seasonal eating, for example. We just think it's totally normal to have apricots all year round or whatever, right? Well, well it's not, actually. Um, and it's much healthier to, to eat seasonally. And of course, um, uh, if people started to eat seasonally, they might realize that they are contiguous with that thing out there that they've been told to call the environment. Um, and and uh, it's, it seems to me that rethinking our ways of farming that have particularly in the last few decades become hyper-industrialized uh, would, would be a good thing. And that might mean that at various times of the year we'll have to do without. And it might mean right now in the UK, you, you cannot really make a living from farming. And, uh, and up until recently, farmers survived on EU subsidies. They've now lost those uh, through, through Brexit. And it's not clear what to do. So they are largely surviving by waiting on promises from the governing party, from the Conservative Party, just hand them money so that they can live. Well, that's not a, a sustainable, to use a popular word, that's not a sustainable way of, 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 of having a, a rural uh, population. So um, one thing we could do, and this might sound a little bit nationalist, so forgive me, but one thing we could do is just start eating the food that we produce. Uh, and and not bringing you know not not having strawberries from Dorset rather than Morocco you know and and actually uh, uh, eating our own food and that might mean eating seasonally but that would be a very good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we have to admit that uh, agriculture uh, is going also in a digital revolution. Not only us, also the farming is developing a lot. Uh, California is known for Los Angeles and, uh, and San Francisco, uh, big cities, but it's a farming country, Far farming state, sorry. And farmers there are connected with Google. <laughs> In their tractor, they are connected and they know exactly what to do to preserve energy and to better control this. So I think that intelligence is entering into this sector. Uh, I have a, a colleague in the Brussels University, which is uh, working on drones. There is a massive development of use of drone in farming. Uh, he's working on research project uh, uh, financed by Ferrero, the champion of the Nutella. The, because uh, you, to produce Nutella, you need oil palm, palm oil and, uh, and nuts. So that means farming. And the demand of Nutella is exploding in the world. So everything you know in the, uh, the, uh, with this project is made to control better not only uh, the insect, but also the use of fertilizer and, fertilize, uh, and uh, the phytopharmaceutical product. So I think that, uh, you, know, uh, the, uh, the, you know the Kuznets curve. Kuznets curve is showing uh, for the camera, <laughs> that uh, we, we, we increase the problem, then we realize that it's a problem, and we solve it. So the farming is the going in the same direction, and also pollution. 
we had pollution, then we realized that it's not good to have pollution, and we dropped the pollution. And same thing with farming. We are in the process of growing up. We, we grow up, sorry, and now we realize that we need to go down with technology. And it's, uh, it will help us and create also uh, good development technology, creating jobs, innovative jobs, not only for farmers, but also for technicians and engineers. I think we could do this all afternoon. Uh, uh, so, so much fun. I am going to um, show my de generosity by offering the audience a chance to ask a, a question of any of the panelists on any of the wide range of, of topics we've, we've covered, if, the, if anyone has any questions. We'll wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you, Can Erjan. Uh, I'm energy advisor at the Turkish delegation to the EU, permanent delegation to the EU. Uh, I'm also uh, pursuing my PhD uh, in Groningen University uh, in energy. Uh, it's a brilliant uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, there is right now uh, we have abundance of energy in the world, and it is very interesting that we are having an energy crisis. So uh, we are going through an energy crisis in the middle of uh, energy abundance. So this is my first remark. And uh, also for the first time uh, in the world, the energy transition is shaping not because of the market dynamics and trade relations, but by politicians and politics. It's a political transition indeed. Uh, it not by the, the, the trade dimensions or the marketing uh, conditions. And, and uh, uh, for the energy transition, uh, the, the missing thing is mining. And uh, interestingly, 70% of the mining cost comes from energy. And currently, 80% of the world economy is based, based on fossil fuel. And in 2050, it is going to be 80% again. It means that we need energy for mining, which is based on fossil fuels. And uh, as for copper, copper is very in, uh, important in terms of energy transmission. Because when you produce energy, it's not like uh, cell phones. You need copper, you need transmission lines. So the calculations show that in seven years, in the next seven years, we will need exactly the same amount of copper that we produced in the last 5,000 years. So it is in incredibly uh, impossible. So. Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, the geopolitical and political uh, ramifications of this big change in terms of uh, mining, in terms of raw materials, in terms, in terms of critical minerals, because I didn't mention lithium, uh, nickel, aluminium, steel, because we need for, for this big, big, huge energy transition for renewables, we need all these uh, elements and uh, minerals, which are unfortunately heavily concentrated in some countries and uh, in some continents. We don't have them in, in Europe, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, refining capacity. And also, some, lastly, some, we have some new words like upscaling uh, and urban mining. So the, the, these will be some new words that we will have, uh, we will continue to hear about. So I would like to ask the re political ramifications in terms of foreign policy uh, in, uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can react on that. Um, this is what I saw. Uh, I, I said, uh, hell, I, was a I was a businessman and I entered politics in, um, well, I entered the, the I entered politics in 2017, I entered the European Parliament in 2019. I immediately start 
I started with um, speaking out my concerns about this energy transition because w what you mentioned that that was the problem that I saw already in 2017. Um, that's why I think this energy transition is not the right thing to do. We can solve our problems. That's why I start to advocate for nuclear energy. Um, I had in the first month of my uh, mandate in, in the European Parliament, I had a an, uh, meeting with Foratom and um, this lady said, Rob, it's not possible anymore after Fukushima, it's um, everyone um, is afraid of nuclear energy. But I said, it's the only way to do it. And also this research in the next generation of nuclear energy, uh, the fourth generation of molten salt reactions, I think it, it's so important to do that because that will make us independent and it can make every continent, it can make every country independent on all these raw materials and all this uh, fossil fuel uh, from from strange countries um, and, 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 and having more energy means that the, the uh, the prosperity of the people in every country will grow. And I think that's the way to do it. You mentioned copper because we have decentralized energy production uh, well, by, by all these wind farms, um, wind turbines all over the country, um, uh, solar panels, but also the electrification of uh, our uh, mobile system, so the, the, the cars, etc. We need so much copper that we have to change our grid. My background is an electrical engineer, so I th th that's that's my speciality from the past. Um, only in my the small country, the Netherlands, we are a very small country. It will cost 102 billion euros to to change our grid. And if you because because of the decentralized energy production, if we go back to uh, to replace our coal-fired power plants by nuclear power plants, you can just replace them. You can use that grid because it's it, normally it's good. So that that means um, less mining, less waste because mining is also um, uh, it's also meaning a, a lot of waste. You have to 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 dig for uh, huge amounts of of soil to get this little uh, piece of, of all this scare materials out. And and especially, um, and I'm going to mention then for the third time, uh, third time uh, today, um, the molten salt reactors that can use um, thorium, that is available in, in huge amount and it's everywhere. So for me, that's the real solution. And I really don't understand why the commission is still uh, try to um, to get that out. Thank you. Um, the, we we had a, a problem uh, in Europe because uh, about thirty years ago, it has been thought that we do not need mining, and progressively, all the engineering school closed progressively their section on mining uh, and mineral preparation. Uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, we, they have been obliged to uh, join Nancy in France, Liège in Belgium, and Luleå in Sweden to keep one school of mining engineering. You imagine. Of course, this is not the case in China, nor in Russia, and not in the USA. And they are progressing because we just thought that there is no future for them. We cannot, uh, as you rightly say, we cannot hope to have an energy transition or green transition or decarbonization, as they call it, without mining. It's just impossible. And you rightly remind that 80% of uh, the energy used uh, uh, for mining is 80% uh, of the cost is energy. Mine is energy, mine is work, work is energy. And so we have a huge problem here. We should change our mind and not say that we do not need mining. Of course we need mining. That's why we stop also shale gas in Europe, you know? We have shale gas in Europe. 
but we do not have the miners, not the technology, not the vision to say, okay, we, we have it, we use it. Big, uh, big geopolitic mistake. That's a ge geopolitic mistake. Other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question for Sebastian. Uh, you were talking about uh, conservation, uh, regreening, and all the language that's being used for that now. Um, one word that always comes to mind for me is um, increasing biodiversity. Uh, and to me, it, uh, it tickles me the wrong way because to me it always sounds like they are trying to play God. Um, and I really would just like to kind of know your opinion on why they are changing also this language usage? Well, uh, I don't know uh, why these changes take place. I'm interested in what the changes entail. Um, I, uh, it, uh, this uh, term biodiversity or increasing biodiversity has been coupled with the re rewilding project. Now, um, I'm not... Uh, uh, per se against that entire um, project. I think I think there are as aspects of it that are quite eccentric. Um, after uh, 17,000 years of, of them being absent, uh, we've just introduced uh, bison into the English countryside uh, in uh, the county of Kent, um, which, uh, you know, seems to me slightly eccentric, but um, uh, I'm, you know, also fun, and I'm up for a bit of fun. So, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, which is the first Labrador or something to get crushed by a bison, by some uh, dog walker. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not per se against this. But interestingly enough, what people seem to be denying at the moment is that the rewilding project is going to have to be uh, coupled with um, with conservationism as traditionally conceived. So I'll give you an example of this. The largest forests in the UK are all in Scotland. But even in Scotland, we don't have that many forests. So they're trying to um, uh, plant enormous, uh, uh, um, you know, square miles of, of uh, scotch pine, which is a beautiful tree, a um, uh, really majestic tree. Um, but the trouble is that they have a very large red deer population in uh, in in Scotland, um, and so the moment you plant one of these saplings, the red deer come and eat them all. So Scotland has simultaneously had to commission a very large number of professional deer stalkers to go and shoot as many of these red deer as possible. Right? Well. Um, so at the same time as we're being told that this entire project is a retreat from human cultivation to allow the natural world just to take its course and flourish and, uh, and, and, and be uninterrupted by our agency, we're having to send people in with very sophisticated pieces of technology called rifles um, in, in order to reduce the... And, and right now, the... Uh, the Scottish government is saying that if they're going to have a successful rewilding project in Scotland, they might need to halve the entire red deer population. Okay, um, now um, you know uh, that. I mean, that might be terrific for deer stalkers, but it's not. It's not consistent with the with with the vision of rewilding and the vision of of biodiversity that seems to be pushed. So we're already running into all of these tensions and those kinds of tensions arise out of an erroneous conception of the world and so it seems to me just to bang the same drum over and over again the 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 the, the solution here is to return to a more traditional conception of of conservationism now that hasn't always been a happy story um uh, uh traditional conservation ha has a mixed record but it it also, because it is prudential and, and conservative, it has a tradition of self-correction as well. A, a very good example is in the United States, where um, the, the hunting community almost wiped out the, the white-tailed deer, and then they realized they were going to have nothing to hunt, so they brought it all back, and they had a massive 
Uh, yes, a, a huge project to bring it back, and now it's one of the most uh, uh, you know widespread creatures in in North America. So there is. It also has this tr tradition of correcting itself. Um, the, the the trouble with with progressive ideology is it has no tradition of correcting itself, uh, and that's what's what's really scary about all of this. Well, I I would just um, comment on that a little bit, and going back to this concept of crisis and emergency, um, we 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 heard we are post oil, right? Years ago we we're post oil. Um, in the 1970s, there was the big push for population control because, because there is somehow this belief that we are incapable of making these both, let's say, micro and macro corrections. And perhaps, I mean, this is maybe a, a topic for another time, but it seems to me that the, that the green movement doesn't believe in human entrepreneurship or creative thinking. Um, it, it, they assume that some um, solution they've dreamt up is the solution rather than asking the people who have made these micro corrections throughout their careers, throughout um, centuries, generations, generations exactly. Um, that's my editorializing here. Um, perhaps one more question for the panel. Thank you. Okay, this question has to do with the EU pollution directive, and it's not mine. It comes from a colleague of mine, a news writer for the European Conservative, who can't be here today. She asks, the, Europe, the, the EU's pollution directive, which applies to farming and other industries, is undergoing revisions to align it with the Green Deal. The commission wants to tighten it to include smaller family farms, but the AG committee of the parliament has already pushed back hard, calling in fact for cattle farms to be excluded from the directive, a, more ha uh, a move hailed by farmer groups. What do you think are the chances the directive can be loosened or to help farmers such as the beleaguered Dutch farmers? Well, the, uh, the AGRI um, committee is uh, fortunately uh, much more realistic than the NV committee, where I'm in. The NV committee, that's really a um, committee with uh, activists. Uh, sorry that, to say it like that, but it's, it's really what's going on. The problem is that uh, in a lot of things, the NV committee has the lead. And... Um, but but I, my hope is on the uh, agri uh, committee to to push back um, b because our Dutch government uh, was pushing for maybe uh, two decades to get a more uh, to to scale up for for farmers. So they invested a lot of money. Um, they bought. The, the the lands and and the and, and and the cattle from their neighbors to to scale up because that was the only way to survive and now the commission is coming with a plan it's the other way around so these farmers are really hooked up with a lot of debt and that's th that's not how you we should treat them because um if you make an investment you you have to to make the ability to earn it back and that's not they are real trouble they are it's really really bad and it's so bad that these people that there are a lot of farmers has have have committed suicide it's it's so bad and no one has attention for that so i hope that the agri committee will push back very hard and um, and of course, air pollution is also uh, a thing that that concerns me. I live in the uh, close to the port of Rotterdam. Have we have all this industry? But it, it, it's also a part of of making money and make life better. Eh? So it has also a, a good side. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, prosperity. And uh, but but I think uh, what we've done in the last forty years is to make 
this air pollution so much um, we, we developed it in so in, in, a, in such a good way that that we have done a tremendous job already and of course we are not at the end we have to improve but yeah well if we still investing in biomass which really is bad for air polluting then uh, then we come back to the point where we can talk about uh, hypocrisy thanks Well, uh, I think I think I speak for everyone in this room that there's uh, we've just we've just scratched the surface of a really fascinating topic. Um, I think we should take from from this discussion uh, certainly a reminder that the words we use matter, and just because someone calls something renewable, sustainable, um, doesn't mean. Uh, that that's what they are, um, but also, what do they mean when they say these things? So, uh, not letting um, not letting the green agenda force our language use, and let let's let's think about the words we're using. Um, as as I was thinking about how to encapsulate this conversation, very challenging, but. I was thinking about um, this idea of the goal of rewilding, right? So rewilding at the same time, we are dehumanizing. And dehumanizing uh, is meant to be this uh, double entendre a little bit because what they want, it seems to me, is for us to be cold, hungry, poor, and dirty. <laughs> Uh, dehumanizing us. But frankly, uh, I think at least in the fringes of these, uh, this movement, what they want is a planet without human beings. They want to dehumanize planet Earth and rewild it with something much better. So with that, uh, I'd like to again thank our panel uh, and thank all of you who are here live in the audience and those of you watching us uh, in the future. Thanks again.